<laughs> ah, salut. Hey, orchid peeps. Welcome to Alpilar Orchids, and thanks for checking in. Are you going to sneeze again? <laughs> Tonight, we'll, we'll take a quick glance, a very quick glance, through some of the things that are happening in our collection of orchids. First, want to just comment an uh, um, idea about collecting orchids and what makes an orchid collection or an orchid collector and are you an orchid collector i mean what defines that that's such a you know honestly it kind of seems like a pretentious term uh, when even when i say it i hear myself i'm like i'm not a collector uh, i just grow orchids or house plants or whatever you know i think of a collection as uh, like old keys or you know old cameras or cameras uh you know something that has a defined parameter uh, but orchids is such a large group of things you know uh, so just i looked up the definition of a collection and according to oxford dictionary online it says a group of things or people so yeah if you own more than one orchid, I suppose you are an orchid collector. <laughs> now, I want to frame this in a way that uh, to me makes a little bit more sense in that uh, it also motivates me and I, I think maybe motivates some of you guys out there to be more diligent about your orchid growing and, and actually think about it more than just, oh, I want some flowers. Uh, we all want flowers, but, uh, you know, what kind of flowers do you want? What kind of plants do you want? Uh, that is what you need to think about when you define a collection, per se. Uh, otherwise, it's just a bunch of plants that, you know, maybe will live for some amount of time, maybe won't live forever. You know, I think, uh, again, going back to what defines a collection, to me, it's something that, you know, you could pass down to, like, the next generation, right? Or, or group up and give away to somebody uh, as a group of things. So, for instance, for us, you know, I, I have this little plant here to show uh, as an example of, of some of the things that I think define collections for us in orchids. And that is our d flash seedlings, which is like a subgroup of all the plants that we grow. And now this one in particular, you know, I'm not sure is a great example for a collection simply because the two parents that make this orchid, uh, they, so this is Carmela's Maynawi crossed with Telbird, supposedly, according to the tag. But, uh, you know, when I asked around uh, online and looked around, tried to do some research, neither of the parents of this have actually been registered. So, in essence, this is a grocery store no ID that you would pick up. And it's like, okay, I'm not sure I want to keep this as part of our collection. Quite honestly, it looks like every other grocery store foul, or maybe half of the grocery store fouls you see out there, and uh, it's way smaller and the nurseries that pump out those grocery store fowls, you know, they've got like 30, 50 flowers on multiple spikes and it, they sell it for 10 bucks, you know, and we've grown this plant for three years out of flask and it came out looking like this. Great. So is this part of a collection? Well, I suppose, because we own it and it's part of our d -flash seedling group. Now, I'm not going to disparage it. I think some of you who have been with this channel for a while and watched us, uh, you know, well, thanks to you guys. And if you're new to the channel, maybe consider subscribing for some more introspection on orchids. Um, but, you know, I love deflasking new seedlings because I just, you never know what you're going to get and it could be something very rare and spectacular, uh, which, you know, going back to the investment idea, maybe it's something that doesn't exist anywhere else and you have a one-off, especially if it's a seed-grown cross, uh, a new cross, new genetics. Well, you know, you could have something special on your hands. And if you don't, well, hey, whatever, just take it out of your collection. Give it to a friend, try to sell it, whatever. Uh, throw it away, I don't know. Toss it out in the garden and see what nature does to it. Um, 
Yeah, so, uh, you know, going back to like our orchid collection, uh, I think, uh, how many times have I done quotation, air quotes here in this video? Um, <clears throat> you know, we, we try uh, to have part of our collection uh, be defined as the Paphiopetalums, and, and one of our goals in orchid growing, so quick aside, right, part of having a collection, I think uh, that that tends to promote this idea of setting some goals and some uh, benchmarks to measure that collection by. And so another sub-collection within our orchids is our Paphiopetalums. And we only have less than 30 species right now, um, but you know the idea of, in my head was to see if we could collect all of the species Paphiopetalums and have that as a group. Now, for me, if I, if you know, looking forward into the future, if you have every species Paphiopetalum growing, and you could take those species and give them away, or or you know, group them and try to sell them. Well, that has a bit more value than just a, a random collection of hybrid paphiopetalums, right? Uh, in my head. Now, of course, I don't define the market and I don't define what is a collection. And, you know, there's, there's no uh, true uh, gatekeeping, let's say, although a lot of people online will try to do that. Um, but, you know, for me, it, it's like it helps to kind of establish these goals and, and something to work towards uh, that helps define the collection other than just a random group of plants that you grow in your house. On that note, let's take a quick look through our collection. Uh, we're only going to focus on a few things that are happening and new. Um, you know, another way to define a collection is, uh, is by having the most diversity that you can have. Maybe you, your collection is defined by having, you know, 10 different genera. So you've got Paphiopetalums, you have uh, Phalaenopsis, you grow uh, uh, Cattleyas and Vandas, and I mean, there's so many genera. Um, you know, that could be your definition is to get as varied a collection as possible. And that is setting a goal and working towards something. And so when you're doing research and you want to buy a new plant or you get excited, you're like, hey, I don't have this genera in our collection, right? That's just, to me, that's just better than saying, oh, I don't have that plant. Because um, then why buy it if, uh, yeah, I, okay, fine. If you just like the flower, then buy it and, and try it. Anyway, let's look at a couple orchids in our collection uh, and uh, see what's happening because there's a lot of exciting things happening now that we're going into fall. Of course, we will have our orchid interlude of the day. Today, it's about some maintenance. So let's do that first. So for your orchid uh, interlude of the day, it is a maintenance interlude and uh, just, you know, kind of playing on the... Ooh, that was loud. Sorry playing on the seedling collection. This is a flask uh, that we deflasked, uh, I don't know when we did this, Fal Allura Catherine, crossed with Ganlin Diamond. Now, again, with this, I have not actually researched to see if this is a registered hybrid or if either of these parents have been registered, uh, but I thought it might be an interesting cross and quite honestly, I was just buying any Phalaenopsis seedlings that were available through Rolka, what was Rolka, uh, which is now Equigenera Europe. And they sell these little orca packs. They're pretty cheap for like 10 euros. You get five or so plants typically in a little cup. And this was one of those. And this is what we do with them. Uh, we have better luck putting them in compots with the Phalaenopsis, just in our conditions. Now I know you know, the plant propagator, he's uh, mentioned that his do better when he plants them alone, but he doesn't do many Phalaenopsis. He does mostly Cattleyas, from what I see, or others. And his conditions are, well, a lot better than ours, so the plants typically will grow a lot faster. And in our conditions, we just got to baby them a little more, and when we plant them alone, we don't have nearly as good a growth. And so we get decent growth when we do these compots. 
But now is the time to separate these. They are starting to get a bit crowded. You can see the root growth is pretty, pretty good. I'm happy with this root growth. Uh, and so it's time to separate these. So I've got a couple little pots I may just reuse. There's like four. Well, these are actually two plants that uh, have a shared stem. And so it's an interesting trait, which I really do like about that. You know, speaking of collection, uh, maybe getting interesting traits, uh, different traits into the plants is part of your collecting goal. And so this is one worth keeping, in my opinion, because these two, these two little growths are from one shared stem, as we'll show you. And same with the other two. Let's shake it out of here. And I'll have to gently try to tease these roots. Oops, broke that one. Whatever. Not going to stress about it. Yeah, but they're definitely growing through and sticking. Ah! Oopsie. Sorry, boss. Lo siento, jefa. Keep going. Just get it out. Yeah, we're really going to have to be a bit gentle on these so as not to damage these roots as much as possible. I feel like once I can get one of these out, then the other will be easier. See, like this one's like woven. It's outside and then it grows inside and then it's outside. Yeah, that one's going to be tough. Like this little one should come out now. It's just wrapped around the other one. But yes, you can see that they're starting to get a little too crowded in there. All right, so here you go. Now you can more clearly see that these two growing stems are part of one plant, which is, I mean, not necessarily unique. Uh, there are other, other orchids, uh, Phalaenopsis, that do this. Yeah, just pull that out. Okay, so it looks like maybe a new root was starting to grow there or is starting. But uh, generally, these Phalaenopsis grow, they're monopodial, which means they have one growing stem. So for the fact that these two plants both show two stems on one growth point, uh, to me that's a nice characteristic, and maybe it means that they'll just be more bushy in the long run, and they'll keep shooting off what we call basal growths, growths that come from the bottom of the plant here. Anyway, uh, that's the deal on this one. Let's see, I mean, this root, I'll leave it on there. It's kind of greenish, but yeah, it's broken at the bottom. Same with this one. I'm not going to tear those off right now. They will at least help sustain the plant to, and uh, let it recover while it grows uh, new roots. But you can see right now is a good time. Uh, why I chose is because we've got some growing root tips just coming out. And it's nice to see this branching root habit, which not all Phalaenopsis do, a lot of them do, but it's nice if they branch because it just makes for a more dense root system. So yeah, give the plant a quick wash under the sink. I don't think these are bugs, it's just debris, little pieces of whatever. Let's wash it real quick. Put it into, let's see, I think this biggest one I will use that over. Yeah, let's use this biggest one. I've got my media here. This is simply bark mixed with some leca. And uh, yeah, it's medium sized bark, medium to large sized bark chips, which I know a lot of people like to use small bark for their seedlings. But uh, yeah, I like air down in the bottom of the root zone. And so for me, large bark, even for seedlings, is fine because it just gives a bit more air and moisture retention. Well, I suppose smaller bark gives better moisture retention, whatever. All right, so these roots, because they're so like unwieldy, we're gonna have to do the twist method. Today was watering day, so the roots are, are soaked and a bit pliable. I'll show you kind of how I try to coax them in. Bend them gently without breaking them tuck it down in, and then just give it the old twist to kind of get them down in there. Same with that one. Okay, great. That's about where I want it. And then just put some media down in, making sure that it gets down into this like hole under the plant. 
Yeah, that goes that way. Um, you don't want like giant air gaps in there, uh, but yeah, a lot of air is good for Phalaenopsis roots. Uh, just as much air as they have water. So that's important. And it's fairly easy to do with these large size bark chunks. But yeah, gently tuck it down. Fowl roots are pretty pretty hardy. They they they're tough. They can take a lot. But yeah, try to be somewhat gentle on them. Alright, so yep, super fast, easy repot, done. I'll water this in really good and make sure I get this water out. I'll show you that real quick because you gotta do that. Get this so I'll just take a tiny little piece of paper towel like that. Go down and you'll see like as it wicks up all that water. See all that water? Maybe. Maybe you can see all that water. Look at the other dry corner. Just get that standing water out. It doesn't have to be perfectly dry because it's morning time right now. So it'll dry throughout the day. Put it in a nice uh, airy location to help it dry out. And that'll be fine. So, yep. So one repot done. And hopefully that helps this plant to grow nice and big and healthy. And maybe in a couple of years we'll have something worth, uh, worth keeping. We'll see. I'm not sure. Uh, now for the next one. I'll probably use the same pot for this one and just kind of re reestablish the roots and tuck them in so they're not all sticking out and growing like aerial roots. Uh, but yeah, I just kind of got to separate them. <laughs> all right, so a nice root system, honestly, for this little uh, seedling here. You can see, again, why did I just want to do this now besides the overcrowding? We've got a root, a new root growth coming out there, and a new root, two new roots coming out here at the base. So this guy is getting some nice new roots. Again, as you can see, two growth points from this Phalaenopsis. They're connected there at the base. Um, so really interesting uh, characteristic from this, this hybrid. And yeah, I'll just put it right back into this. Down some fresh media. Well, you can see like, oh man, I may need some bigger chunks. These are all, now I've used up a lot of my bark. You know what, honestly, eh. It's the same plant, so I don't mind reusing some of the same media. These bigger chunks in the bottom, that's fine. If it was a different plant, I probably wouldn't. But since it's the same plant, uh, same pot, so whatever. If there was any, you know, contamination or whatever, I would... I would uh, not use the same. I wouldn't want that, but uh, this isn't going to work. No, that's not going to work. Let's do something else. Well, okay, speaking of collections, you know, we've got a collection of pots here, like all these nice clear pots that we've collected from the plants that haven't made it, so you can see how many we lose. I think I'm going to use this one, though. It's uh, fairly similar to... The other one, I, oops, yeah, I watered it. The other one I used, right? So uh, I think this one will do just nicely. Again, I don't care. I'm just going to throw some of this media back in here. It's fine to reuse. It's not, it's only eight months old and the bark still looks okay. It's not great, but whatever. It's not horrible either. All right, now we'll just do the same thing. We'll do the little tuck and twist method. And I don't really mind about those broken roots, um, but with broken roots, uh, you know, some people will correctly say that it is a point where bacteria or infection can enter the plant and cause problems. And that's true, but honestly, for the fowls, from what we've seen, broken roots are just fine. They'll oftentimes still live, and sometimes they'll branch just like a, um, a stem if you cut it. You know, there's dormant nodes further up, closer to the base of the plant, and so sometimes the roots will actually branch after a break. So I just leave it on there, and it's fine. Again, it'll help sustain the plant while it recovers and grows new roots. Eh, whatever, you know. I don't stress too much about that kind of stuff. Now what I am stressing about is all these fines and dust and crap. This is really like, I've had, these are the 
These are the last of a couple bags of media that we had laying around. And so I poured them, just mixed them into this cup to use later. Uh, this isn't great, but whatever, you know, I don't really, I'm not going to stress. You know, that's the point. Uh, part of our ethos here is that orchids shouldn't be stressful. And it's like, hey, if it's not perfect media, whatever. It may be better than the other media you're using. You never know, right? Like it's, you know, unless you have the absolute perfect media and the absolute perfect formula, which I don't know who does. Uh, who cares? Uh, maybe it'll be better. Maybe it'll be worse. Give it a shot. See, you can always repot this thing in another six to eight months. Not really preferable to keep repotting your fowls that often, but hey, if you need to, it's fine. They, they're okay with that. It's not like they're most of the fowls anyway. Uh, you can, it's not a big deal to repot them a bit more frequently. I mean, I say frequently, I mean, once every year or two is frequent repotting for orchids. Mm, yeah, no more than that. So, okay, you can see nice, uh, we've got all the root tips coming out. There are some air spaces down here in this media uh, in the pot. So it's not like absolutely packed full down there, but uh, we've got media everywhere down into the center of the pot. So there's no giant, huge air spaces but at the same time, it's not completely compact. So I got to find a pot for this guy. Ah, what do you know? Perfect. That works out beautifully. I'll use that. My oh, boss will be mad. Now I've done. It's watered in just like this one. I need to make up a second tag that has the name. Uh, that's super important. Make sure you're labeling, especially if you're trying to grow a collection. You need to keep things labeled and organized and what is what, so I gotta make sure I make up another tag for this one. And hopefully in another year, we'll see some blooms. I mean, these guys look like they're, they're getting ready. They're starting to show some signs of maturity now, although they're still seedlings. So some quick updates on our collection, if you will. Uh, first, we'll look at this hybrid Paphiopetalum, which was our uh, project orchid that we have for this year's project. And I repotted it a couple weeks ago. It came, it came to us a bit floppy. And so I mentioned in that video, we just grow our floppy paths kind of propped upright mechanically. And already after a couple weeks, you can see it's starting to stand up on its own. I'll leave it growing against the radiator like this for a little bit longer. And then it should be fine to move away and just grow like all the rest of our paths kind of, you know, stand well, our multi-floral large strap leaf papiopetalums. It'll grow just on its own, uh, you know, upright. But for now, I'm going to leave it here to help it continue to stand upright. This is a uh, Sophronitis. Well, I've always kind of thought of it as a uh, no ID bifoliate Cattleya type. Don't know. I um, we got a comment from Inze at Inze Orchids over there in the Netherlands, and he thought maybe this is. I think he said a Sophronitis. I don't know. It's an orange flower. It is getting a sheath uh, from this newest growth. Now this is out of season. Uh, normally it blooms in the spring for us. It puts on a sheath like it's starting in. Uh, late January or February, and then by June or July, it's in flower. So this is weird for us that it's growing this sheath now, and uh, maybe it won't bloom this year. It'll just put on a false sheath. I don't know. It's bloomed for the last two years for us. We won't look at the Cattleyas, but here's one of our Cattleyas in our collection, and like most of them, they are growing new growths right now, which is great to see. This one has three new growths on it, which is nice. They all look really good and healthy. And we just water them once a week right now. Uh, it's growing indoors. We had these growing outside as soon as we got back about a month or now, four or five weeks ago, we moved it back inside up high. So the warmest we can give it inside with the highest light possible. Yeah, right next to this no ID. Some other interesting things for us in our collection. 
This was our first attempt at taking a division of a catacetum, and it has grown, oops, just dumped a bunch of water from the, the reservoir. It's grown in semi-hydroponics. It grew this new pseudobulb this year, and then now it stopped growing. Oh crap, I keep dropping water. It stopped growing, so I think it's going to start going into dormancy soon. We're still watering it every day and fertilizing it pretty heavily. Uh, this is a FDK, Fred Clark Yara After Dark Black Pearl, SVO Black Pearl. And our first attempt at taking divisions from a catacetum, and this is the result. So we're happy about that. Uh, hopefully next year it gets back on track and grows bigger pseudobulbs like you can see it's grown a couple larger ones and now it's gotten a, a rinky dink one from this year's growth whatever that's fine it also grows up high in our highest warmth and highest light possible inside of our apartment no id seedling so that's there this is where we grow a lot of our seedlings kind of on the middle shelf uh, highest, well, it's, uh, it's farthest away from the lights. So they get a lot of light, but they're not directly under the lights. This little Phalaenopsis back here, it's very small, has two flowers that have lasted for, geez, a few months now, a couple months. And it is also a D-flash seedling. We asked around uh, and did some research in Ray, uh, maybe uh, some of you in the online spheres know Ray, and he always is willing to help us out and look up some crosses for us. This, this cross, this white with this nice lip, is, uh, came to us registered in the Orca Pack as a Chiata Francis Piketty crossed with Lulin Hot Lip. And when Ray looked it up for us, he came back and said that it is, it is registered as Luha Okapurle. I think I'm pronouncing that right. So this is actually a registered hybrid. And I really love the lip. The flowers are really big for the size of this tiny plant. And they last a long time. So for me, this is a real winner in our speculation of new fell hybrids. That's a real winner. And we have a couple of those, so hopefully they all bloom and look good. We'll see. And these will just start to give away or sell or something. I don't know. It's cool, but it's just, you can, again, buy that at the grocery store for a lot less money and a lot bigger plant. Here on this same shelf recently, we haven't shown you guys yet on our channel, but we have two Phalaenopsis marii's and both of them are growing spikes right now. Although they've grown these spikes, they're very tiny and they've both grown a spike and now they've kind of stalled. So I'm not sure what's going on. This plant is a recovery uh, rescue orchid from an online friend of ours. We've owned this plant now for like three years or so, two and a half years. Finally, it's starting to recover and yeah, show signs of life. Although I'm not sure it's gonna bloom from that spike. It may just stall. Here's the other one back here. I'll show you this. So here is the growing spike on this Phalaenopsis marii. So you can see again, a smaller spike, although this one is developing much more rapidly and looks a lot healthier. You can see the little buds growing on it. I mean, these are tiny. They're so small. See them there? Yeah, so this one actually looks pretty good and we're confident that this one will flower. This Maria we purchased from uh, Schwerte. So it was a, uh, a nursery bought plant and, you know, obviously it probably came to us in a lot better condition. Uh, but it's interesting that both of those marii put on spikes at exactly the same time. Right at the end of summer, they started to grow uh, spikes. So. And then for some diversity, some diversity in our collection, 
Here is the um, Brasidium shooting star's black gold, and it's growing a spike again this year. Of course, it's shaken all over. These spikes grow really fast, and they then they just take forever, it seems like, to actually open the flowers. But this will be the second year in a row that it has grown a spike. We did grow this outside as well for the last two seasons, and now we've brought it back in. It has a new growth down at the base there. You can maybe, maybe you can see it. Yeah. So this plant's looking really nice after we brought it back in. It was struggling outside. It was getting a lot of exposure. And I think it's happy again now that we've brought it back in and yeah, given it a little bit more TLC, so to speak. So it's Paphiopetalum primulinum, supposedly like not a multifloral, but a sequential bloomer on the primulinum. It's producing what looks to be two or three three buds down in there right now on a very short inflorescence. It uh, is grown in bark, which is one of our only paphiopetalums that we do not grow in semi-hydroponics. And we water it once a week, just along with our fowls. We have uh, paphiopetalums typically growing lower to the floor because they're cooler growers, uh, generally speaking. The paphiopetalums can be cooler growers, can tolerate colder temperatures. So we grow them closer to the ground and to the floor. And every time we open the back door, of course, cold air rushes down and around and swirls through this room. And it's definitely chilly down at the bottom. So we don't like to grow our Phalaenopsis too close to the ground, just to keep the temperatures as high as we can. Paphiopetalum species is the Libyanum, a fantastic uh, orchid in our Paphiopetalum species collection. Uh, I recommend this to anybody who wants a Paphiopetalum or to try to grow slipper orchids because it's a very vigorous grower. Lots of growth uh, down at the base, new growth coming on, and it's a sequential bloomer, so it um, it just keeps putting out flower after flower. This particular cultivar that we have seems to hold like three flowers most of the time. It just dropped the last flower and is now, you know, there's one or two more that are starting to form there. All told, we've had uh, seven or eight flowers on this particular plant just this season. And it's been in bloom now for several months and the blooms are just fantastic. I love them. They're so cool. This is a great, great plant. Um, and the genetics on the Limianum seem to be really good uh, compared to some plants. You know, some of the species, the original genetics can be a little weak or, you know, temperamental, but these seem to be very strong. Most of the plants we see online are really healthy. So yeah, go and get you a Limianum if you want to try Paphiopetalums. Uh, we grow this one in semi-hydro, just like most of our paths. And uh, this plant drinks so much water. And so it's, it's one of the ones that we really make sure that twice a week we fill up the reservoir and keep it hydrated. It loves to have moisture around the roots. And um, yeah, we did take the pollen, pollinia off of this last flower to use in a cross. And that was over a week ago. And so you can see now that it's still holding on even after you harvest pollen, the paphiopetalums will hold their flowers, which is really nice. And then right next to it is the Phalaenopsis borneensis, which has been pollinated now and it's been over a week it's starting to well it's been just actually less than a week it's starting to show signs that it was a good pollination so we'll keep you posted on this as it goes along if it makes it or doesn't you will find out if you stay tuned that was cross-pollinated with this the tetraspis green and so the tetraspis green is now starting to yellow up and also showing signs that maybe it was a good pollination. 
We'll see. You never know. So if you want to see more Paphio Petalums or our orchid collection and hybrids, Phalaenopsis species, Catacetums, Catleas, check back in. Uh, you can see this Paphio Petalum that we're experimenting with in water culture simply because we haven't eaten the yogurt out of the container that we're going to put this one into yet. So thanks guys. Hope you're having a good one.